Chapter 6. The next day, the guys came out by the diner, smiling like everything was normal. Chet didn't wave back. He slipped into the kitchen before they sat down at the counter and didn't come out until they were gone. After the breakfast rush was over, Uncle Jerry handed Chet a mug of root beer and told him to have a seat. What's wrong, kiddo? He asked, sitting on the stool next to Chet's. I see you've been avoiding your buddies. They're not my buddies, Chet said. I hardly know them. Uncle Jerry peered at Chet. Is this because of the stunt at the creek? You heard about that, Chet said. Uncle Jerry chuckled, but not in a nasty way. They didn't mean any harm, he said. You should be flattered. How's that, Chet said. They made me feel like an idiot. It means they like you and that you're one of them, Uncle Jerry said. Now they're expecting you to get them back. Don't you know that's how it works? How could Chet know? He'd never had any real friends before. He wanted to know more, but before he could ask, Mr. Colton and Dr. J came through the door. They were Uncle Jerry's oldest friends. Mr. Colton owned the hardware store and Dr. Chet, Dr. J took care of practically everyone in town. They came in every day for coffee and to chat about baseball with Uncle Jerry. But today the men didn't want to talk about Babe Ruth's pitching record. Mr. Colton held up the morning paper so Uncle Jerry oops, and Chet could read the front page headline. Shark kills second bather in New Jersey, July 7th, 1916, Spring Lake, New Jersey. A shark attacked Charles Bruder, 28, while he was swimming alone in the ocean yesterday afternoon. Lifeguards rushed to his rescue, but the young man's wounds were so severe that he bled to death before he reached the shore. Bruder, a well-liked bell captain at the Essex and Su Sussex Hotel, was known to be a strong swimmer, but he was no match for the beast, which attacked without mercy. Before he perished, Bruder was able to tell a remarkable story to his rescuers. He was a big gray fellow and as rough as sandpaper, Bruder said. I didn't see him until after he struck me the first time. That was when I yelled. I thought he had gone on, but he only turned and shot back at me and snipped my leg right off. He yanked me clear under before he let me go. He came back at me and he shook me like a terrier shakes a rat. Bruder tried to say more, but he became too weak. He died of massive blood loss and shock before lifeguards could get him back to the shore. Officials were warning people not to swim alone. I still don't believe it, said Uncle Jerry. Someone's cooking up these stories to sell newspapers. Could be, Mr. Colton said. Folks are terrified, though. My wife's cousin lives out there, and she says nobody will go near the ocean. They have fishermen out there with rifles shooting at anything that moves. You know what this reminds me of, Dr. J said. The creek devil. What's that? Chet asked. Mr. Colton and Dr. J chuckled. Then Mr. Colton shifted his hefty body towards a uh, forward on the stool. He leaned closer to Chet. Old timers say there's a monster that lives down near the creek. He's covered with mud, eats snakes and bats, and makes terrible hissing sounds. He moans, too. Legend is that he comes out every decade and drags a kid back into the mud with him. People believe that, Chet said. Everyone in town knows the legend, Uncle Jerry said, but nobody really believes it. Except for Uncle, except for Jerry here, Dr. J said, slapping Uncle Jerry on the shoulder. When we were little, he wouldn't go near that creek. Bah, Uncle Jerry said, waving his hand at Dr. J. I don't know what you're talking about. Doesn't someone need a wart removed or something? Was Uncle Jerry blushing? Imagine Uncle Jerry being afraid of a made-up monster. Chet smiled to himself. Maybe there was hope for him yet. Suddenly, Chet had an idea for the greatest prank ever. Folks would be talking about it for years, and then he'd be part of the gang for sure. Dewey, Monty, and Sid were going to come face to face with the Creek Devil. Chapter 7. At church on Sunday, Chet went out of his way to say hi to the guys. They seemed relieved that he wasn't mad anymore, and the truth was, he really wasn't now that he understood how it was with pranks, and now that he had a genius plan for getting them back. Come swimming with us today, Sid called as he helped his mother into the buggy. We'll be, we'll be there right after lunch. Sure, Chet called back. I'll meet you. Uncle Jerry patted him on the back. That's the way, kiddo, he said. There's no room in a small town for grudges. Chet was dying to tell Uncle Jerry about his idea, but Chet kept his mouth shut, worried that his uncle might tell someone and spoil the plan. He saw Minnie Martson as he was leaving the churchyard. She waved at him and smiled like she wanted him to go up and talk to her. For months last spring, Chet had prayed that Minnie would look in his direction, but now he didn't have time for girls, not even Minnie. He had to go to the creek before the guys. He waved to Minnie and headed home. Uncle Jerry was going to the diner to take care of some bookkeeping, and Chet headed home to change. He grabbed the bag he'd packed that morning. Inside was a bottle of ketchup, one of his old work boots, and the white cap he always wore at work. Everything he needed. 
He hurried to the creek, which was completely quiet, and went straight to work. His plan had two parts. First, he wanted to make the guys think he'd been attacked and dragged, bloody and screaming, into the creek. He dribbled up some ketchup along the dock, a trail of blood. He put his boot in the middle of the dock and covered it with ketchup, too. He did the same to his cap. Chet stood back and admired his work. So far, so good. Now Chet took off his undershirt and trousers and kicked off his boots. He hid them in the tall grass. Then he went to the wettest part of the bank. He scooped up handfuls of the slimiest mud he could find and smeared it onto his face. His arms and his chest, he used extra mud to cover his head so that no hairs poked through. He had no idea what the creek devil was supposed to look like, but he was pretty sure it didn't have orange hair. Chet was just finishing when he heard voices. The guys! Chet closed his eyes and took a deep breath. Then he let out the biggest, loudest scream he could muster. He screamed like he was terrified, like he was in agony. And then he splashed loudly into the creek, careful not to wash off the mud. He screamed some more and then waded into the reeds and hid. Chet, Sid called, that you? Chet didn't answer. He couldn't see the guys, but he heard their heavy breathing and their panicky voices. Where is he? Is that his boot? What the? Oh my God, Sid whispered, is that blood? Chet held his breath. Would they really fall for it? Could this actually work? Chet, Sid called. Chet, you there? Chet had to puff up his cheeks to keep from bursting out laughing. Is that, is that Chet's cap, Dewey whispered? A few seconds went by. What's happening, Monty said quietly. They were falling for it, and now it was time for part two. Chet gave a low hiss, remembering what Mr. Colton had said about the sound the, the creek devil made before an attack. What the heck was that, Dewey said, his voice shaking. Quiet, Sid said. Should we go get someone? Dewey said, hiss. Chet was impressed by how spooky he sounded. Next, he started to moan, low at first and then louder. Om. He poked his head through the reeds, not all the way through, just enough for the guys to catch a glimpse of a hideous head covered with black slime. The guys stared with bugged out eyes and wide open mouths. Ah, they screamed. Dewey went tearing away. Om. Ah, screamed Sid and Monty. They turned to run, and that's when Chet leaped out of the water. Got you, Chet shouted. Sid and Monty stopped short. Their faces were dead white. I got you good. He waited for their terrified faces to melt into smiles, for them to laugh their heads off and tell Chet he was a genius. But they didn't. Sid stomped onto the dock. He leaned close to Chet, his face all twisted up and furious, and his fists were clenched. Chet jumped back. Was Sid going to deck him? Monty pulled him away. He's not worth it, he said. You're an idiot, Sid growled. We really thought something bad happened to you. How could you think that was funny, Monty said. The words came out of him hard and cold. Sid glared at him for a few more seconds, and then they turned and walked away. Chet stood there in shock. His prank had worked better than he could have imagined, but it was all wrong. And here he was, covered with stinking mud all alone.